is right. We're all on the same side. How can we be? We're all breathing. Every building, every room, every situation, a snapshot. I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm also checking the room, memorizing the people, what they're wearing. Then I ask the question, what's wrong with this picture? Anything suspect? You gotta see it, assess it, and dismiss most of it without looking, without thinking. Without thinking. It's just like breathing. You breathe, don't you? Good morning. Thank you, Juan, and, uh, for that kind introduction, and Diana, Todd, and Michael for inviting me. This has been a great meeting. So you're all breathing. You've been breathing since the third semester, uh, trimester in utero. You've probably taken a couple of hundred million breaths uh, before today. You'll breathe through my lecture, and hopefully you'll take a couple of hundred million more breaths before you ultimately expire. Now, breathing, we tend to think of something happening that with the lungs, and in fact, that's a critical organ for gas exchange. But the real engine for it is in the brain. So we need to think about what's going on in the brain to order in order to understand breathing. So we normally think of breathing as important for making sure we take in enough oxygen for our metabolism. That met metabolic activity produces carbon dioxide, which we have to regulate because that affects the pH, and pH is very important in regulating body function. So we're here right now regulating our pH and taking in enough oxygen to stay awake. But we move air for a lot of reasons. There are all sorts of motor movements where the control of breathing airflow is very critical. Speech, sniffing, uh, swallowing and chewing, we have to coordinate with breathing. We have reflexes to keep the airways patent and uh, make sure that things go down the wrong uh, tube. We sigh, we cough, we sneeze, we yawn. There's also volitional and a cognitive effects on breathing and emotional effects on breathing. So we laugh, we cry, we speak, and so on. And I want to emphasize that the volitional control of breathing and the emotional control of breathing are actually quite distinct. And one of the reasons we know this is the consequence of a very devastating stroke in the brainstem, which cuts off the signaling from the cortex to the muscles. These individuals can't move but they do continue to breathe because the circuits involved in breathing are below the lesion, and they can move their eyes. And their intelligence is normal. Their breathing pattern is very robotic. Uh, if you ask them to change their breathing pattern, they can't, but they respond to changes in blood gases. If you gave them some CO2, their ventilation would go up. However, if you tell them a joke they find funny, they can laugh. So the circuits that are involved in laughter and crying and whatnot are actually a different set of circuits than those that are involved in volitional control. And we can maybe talk about that at lunch. Now, what I'm going to talk about at the end today is the effect breathing can have on our emotional and cognitive function. A single deep breath is very calming. I took a few before I came up here, and it calmed me down quite a bit. Uh, when I'm on the first tee, I'll take a few deep breaths, and, and a single breath is enough to calm you down. And we use breathing exercises in um, Lamaze when women are uh, delivering. Uh, deep breathing during delivery can be very helpful in uh, getting through that very difficult event. Um, and in panic disorder, deep breathing is uh, a very effective means of getting through the toughest part of that very challenging uh, emotion. So I'll talk about that at the end. So breathing is everywhere. Now, the question is, where is the engine for breathing? And in the late part of the 18th century, neuroscientists were looking for this no vital, the node of life, and they realized it was in the brain stem, which is this part of the brain. But they couldn't localize it any more than that. And that's not enough to really understand what's going on. It's a little bit like saying the Grand Canyon is the, in the United States to a geologist. It's not particularly helpful. You have to localize it. And for 200 years, attempts to localize it were not successful. But we were very fortunate through advances in technology and experimental preparations. We localized it to a region in the brain stem 
So here's a side view of the body, and it's a region which we named the pre complex, and it's about here in the brainstem. I don't have time to go through the backstory of how we came up with this name, but just Google Feldman BBC size, and there's a five-minute discussion with the BBC about how we came to name it. So how do we know this is the kernel for breathing? And there's lots of experiments that have been done. And um, what I want to show you is uh, the result in humans. So if this is critical for breathing, if we were to ablate it, if we were to damage it during a neurodegenerative disease, we might expect breathing to be awry. So a um, neuropathologist at the Mayo Clinic taking data we found about a marker for these neurons, looked at individuals who died of non-neurodegenerative diseases, did post-mortem analysis, and this is what the pre complex looks like in these uh, individuals. In individuals who die at the end stages of Parkinson's, they have serious problems of breathing during sleep. And when he looked at the pre in individuals that died with Parkinson's, the census of neurons was down about 60%. And individuals who died with multiple system atrophy, where they have terrible problems of breathing during sleep, the population is down almost 90%. So I think I will st uh, stipulate that the pre complex is the center for breathing. Now, as I segue between one part and another part of my talk, I would like you all to take a deep breath. Uh, that will refresh you if you're falling asleep, you're bored, tired, and whatnot. A single breath may help bring you back and help you focus on the next topic. So if we know where the, the engine is, how is the rhythm generated? And this is a long story that took us 20 more years to figure out. And none of the usual suspects worked. And we eventually found that it's not a phenomenon like the heart, where you have cells which are specialized. It's what we call a network property, that the neurons in the pre complex start out firing randomly after each inspiratory cycle, and then they begin to synchronize. And so the key word is synchronization. Now, why would synchronization be more effective? Well, I'll show you an example of synchronization, but think of a boxer punching once per second but alternating his hands. Okay, now that's gonna have some effect, but each hand is separate. Now imagine at the same rate, he goes boom, boom. Boom, boom. Same rate, but because it's synchronized, it can be much more effective. And that's a key element for how the brain is doing the rhythm. And to show you a, sort of an example, uh, so can I start this? Yes. So here are a bunch of oscillators that are weakly coupled. And you can see they're totally asynchronous. They're, they're not uh, beating with each other. And watch what happens. Very quickly, they begin to get synchronized. And physical objects, biological objects, if they're loosely coupled and they have some sort of background activity, become totally coupled. So this is what's happening in your brain. Every breath, these neurons start out asynchronously and become synchronous. Now, why synchronization? Synchronization can be very stable if you have enough neurons. It can be very robust because we have to do it for our entire life. And it can be very labile, because we have to change breathing very quickly. And so that's satisfied by synchronization. Next subject. I want to talk briefly about sighing. We all sigh. Um, I queried some people here about how often we, we sigh, and they're all off by a factor of 10 or more. You sigh about every five minutes. And that's in order to keep your lungs healthy. But there's also a phenomenon that when you're stressed, your psi rate goes up, and it turns out you release these peptides called bombosin-related peptides. And experiments we did with Mark Krasnow and Kevin Yackel, who is now at UCSF, we said, OK, maybe these are involved in the generation of size of pre-Butzinger. And so we predicted that if we injected these uh, peptides into the pre-Butzinger, we should increase psi rate. And if we block them, we should decrease psi rate. And so here's one of the few pieces of data I'll show you. Each tick mark is a psi in a rat. And these are five different rats. They're sighing about 40 times an hour. And when we give them the, these two peptides, NMB and GRP, the psi rate goes from 40 to 500. 
If we block these peptides, the psi rate goes down. So these peptides are very critical for generating size. And these have consequences of trying to understand the physiological regulation of sighing. And that segues into the next part of the talk, which is how breathing can affect emotion. We have already stipulated that deep breaths are very calming, and a sigh is a deep breath. So when you stress, if you sigh, it's going to relax you. So we uh, did a paper with our colleague uh, Krasnow and, and Yackel. It went viral. Um, this is sort of a fantasy about mice meditating, but in fact, we do have a model where mice can meditate. And I'll show you the data. It's pretty amazing. So what is, what is going on? Why should breathing affect um, emotion? Well, we have all these oscillations in the brain. And what are these oscillations doing? Well, they're helping bind information that's coming in through different senses. And so when you hear me speak and you see me, you don't see two separate things coming in the visual pathways and the auditory pathways. You bind them. And one of the ways they get bound is because these background oscillations are telling the brain that these signals need to be to put together. Now, what is it about breathing? Well, breathing is slower than these other oscillations, and it's unusual because you can control it. So imagine the normal activity in the brain involves your 12 to 20 times per minute breathing. Now you slow it down. That's going to affect the signal processing. And if we look in the brain, we find that we have in all parts of the brain, and these are in rodents and in humans, we find that there are oscillations in addition to the neural activity. There are oscillations that are breathing related. And when we engage in a deep breath or breath work where we change our breathing pattern, we're going to disrupt the normal activity. And that disruption, for reasons that I, we could talk about at lunch, can have a calming effect. And this works both with people who are otherwise healthy, dealing with day-to-day -day stress, but people who have clinical anxiety, depression, and so on. Uh, your pupils oscillate with the respiratory cycle, so it's everywhere. Now, one question is, is this a real effect or is this a placebo effect? We heard um, Ali Crum speak on Friday about placebo effects, so maybe I tell you breath work is going to work, and it works. So we decided to study it in rats. So here's a, a picture of a rat breathing, and there are many, many uh, cycles here. And at one point, we trigger it, and we see this is the normal breathing pattern. And now uh, we look at these. Uh, we look at these animals and we put them through a fear test, and they have a standard response to this fear test. Now, we're using some molecular magic, and we have to thank Ed Borden and Carl Desseroth for some of this. Uh, we can slow the breathing pattern down. So here you see we trigger on an inspiratory effort, and now we prolong the expiration. So these animals slow their breathing down by a factor of 10. They're awake. They like it. We do it 30 minutes a day for four weeks, much like a human would do it. And we then put them through some fear tests. And what happens is they're remarkably less fearful. This is as strong, my psychology friends tell me, this is as strong an effect as they've ever seen with mice being calm. So this paper hopefully will be submitted shortly. But what it means that this is not a placebo effect. So it's real. Try it. And it's a platform to study mechanisms. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is how is this happening? So we can have the pre complex directly affecting emotion. We can have pathways to various structures like the locus ceruleus, the parabrachial nucleus, the vagus nerve we've heard about, because um, volition, and olfaction, because the olfactory signal is modulated. And these are not exclusive, and different patterns of breathing may activate different pathways. And of course, blood gases can have an effect. So now that I've sort of tried to indoctrinate you in the uh, benefits of breath work, um, I've asked, Alyssa has been kind enough to agree to lead us in a unadorned brief breath work cycle. And one of the things I'd like to point out is that the entry level to do breath work is pretty simple. You don't have to subscribe to a belief system. You don't need an instructor. You can do it with an app. And I think it can be very effective. I was uh, a, sort of a skeptic 
10, 15 years ago, and I uh, started to do breath work, and now I drank the Kool-Aid. I really think it is effective. But you have to find out for yourself. So as, as sort of a test, Diane uh, suggested that Alyssa give a, a breathwork uh, session. So with that, I'm going to turn the podium over to Alyssa. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I look forward to speaking to you later at lunch. Thank you very much.